Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome. I uh, apologize for the slight delay. We did want to make sure that we'd have time for folks to make it over from the mosque after Maghrib prayers. Uh, my name is Michael Fiener from the Asia Research Institute here at the National University of Singapore. And I'm very happy this evening to be able to um, introduce Professor Bruce Lawrence as our speaker tonight. I'm sure that uh, Professor Lawrence is well known to most of you here in the audience. He's one of the most distinguished scholars of Islam working in North America today, uh, but also has a very high global profile of teaching and lecturing in the Middle East, in South Asia, and here in Southeast Asia. And uh, we're very pleased to have uh, Professor Lawrence here, not just for tonight's talk, but also as part of our um, conference on Islamic wild spaces and cosmopolitanism that will be running over at the Asia Research Institute on the Bukatima campus uh, tomorrow and Thursday. And all of you are more than welcome to join us for that. Uh, Professor Lawrence's uh, bibliography is very long, and since he likes me to keep it to the point, I won't uh, recite each title. But it's amazing in the breadth of material that's covered in his published writings. Everything from Sufi traditions to contemporary issues of religious identity and religious migration to Quranic studies, which brings us to the topic of today's lecture. In 2006, he published a book called The Quran, A Biography, which was a remarkably accessible way of introducing the sort of the, the figure of the text in the cultural history of Islam uh, and in global discourses on religious studies. And he has a book coming out that I'm really looking forward to see soon that will be out with Princeton University Press this year, Bruce? Uh, next year. Next year. Um, called The Quran in English, which is the title of today's talk. Uh, and so without further ado, I uh, introduce Professor Bruce Lawrence. Well, thank you, Michael. And I'm really privileged to be here. And I've said to some people and others um, should know that I, I arrived yesterday uh, with a very easy trip, but without my bag. Uh, fortunately, I had sent ahead my lecture and I had other notes that were in the bag I was carrying. Um, but if you're going to be coming on to this uh, conference that follows afterwards and you see me in this shirt, these pants, these sneakers, um, the glasses are always the same anyway, but the rest of it was supposed to be changed. But it will be clean. I, I, I've already identified that as a possibility, even a necessity for my host family. So without any further personal reflections uh, about my travel or the state of my dress or health, let me just say that this is the first time that I've uh, obviously spoken in Singapore, but the first time I've spoken about this topic uh, since India, India where I was in September and had many reflections. And I'm actually hoping that, that I'll have maybe one or two of you from this group who will read the, uh, the handout that I gave you and say, he forgot that translation. So I'm one of those scholars who does not object to being corrected, and especially to being expanded in my knowledge. So what you have in that handout is every single one of the 115 translations of the Quran in English that I have been able to identify. So if I've missed one, or if you have several more, please let me know. Um, but just so you know what a long history this is, I thought I would begin and just show you some pictures of the Quran as it was first done. This is the very first English rendition, uh, which everyone notes is only famous because it's first. Uh, otherwise, it's regrettable. Um, and the person who regretted it is Alexander Ross, because he just copied it from the French. And what you'll find out in my talk today is that there are many people who translated the Quran into English, but not from Arabic. They had a help, whether it was Latin or it was German, or in this case, French, that was the antecedent, and then it was translated from French in English. So that's Alexander Ross at work with a pen in hand. Then there's one that's much more famous uh, by Sale, George Sale, uh, where he actually talks about the Koran, uses that phrase, the, the Koran, K-O-R-A-N, and then says, commonly called the El Koran. So he doesn't mind the fact that he's uh, repeating the definite article, the El Quran of Muhammad. And that, of course, is something which many people point out that early English translators thought that because Muhammad was a source of revelation, he was also the author of the Quran. Anybody, whether Muslim or study Islam, know that's a false assumption, but for a long period of time it was assumed if Muhammad, if Muhammad spoke it, Muhammad's also the author. The idea there's a divine revelation and Muhammad is the mouthpiece, but not the author, 
did not occur in some of these early translations. And this I always put in question marks because George Sale died at age 39. And we all get old. Uh, I'm considerably older than 39, but I don't think I'm as old as the man in this picture (laughs) who was supposed to be George Sale. Um, And then we have the first Muslim translator who's Muhammad Ali. And some people say, oh, no, no, he has a Muslim name. He's not really a Muslim because he's a Ahmadi. And I don't think, uh, looking around the faces in this audience, I need to explain anything about Ahmadis. But in the history of Quranic translation, Ahmadis are very important, even though in the consideration of many people today, Ahmadis should not be viewed as Muslim translators of the Holy Quran. Uh, This is the cover of his book, which not only had English translation, but translation with commentary. And many uh, later scholars who were Sunni Muslims even though they objected to the Ahmadis, use Muhammad Ali's translation along with his commentary. Then there's Pikthal. I'm running through all these just to give you a sense of how many there are. Pikthal, Muhammad Marmaduke Pikthal, who was also a scholar, an early English convert to Islam in uh, the beginning of the 20th century. And this is the revised version of his book from 19, of his translation, 1996, The Meaning of the Glorious Quran. Uh, the people from al the Sheikh al said, we will not recommend this unless you agree it's not a translation. What will that take? Use the word meaning. It's not the translation of the Quran, it's the meaning of the Quran. So this is in direct response to um, the Sheikh of al that he called the meaning of the glorious Quran. Well, not quite, because in the earliest version, it's called the meaning of the glorious Quran. But because a lot of people objected to the fact that Quran is not Quran, you can hear that they're close, but not the same. Uh, later editions of Pictal have changed it to mean or to read the meaning of the glorious Quran instead of the meaning of the glorious Koran. Here's what he looked like, very dapper guy. You don't need to think that he's 39. He's not. He's considerably older. Um, and here is the pan who is the most iconic of all the translators of the Quran. People would say, if you have to do a top five, he's in it. If you're top three, you're in it. If you're going to do top one, he's it. So for many people, this man, Abdullah Yusuf Ali, Um, I just have to share something. When I was doing this in India, someone said, you know why he's so famous? And I said, no. Think of his initials. A-Y-A. Ayya. He is an Ayya of the Quran himself. You can say you heard it here, but I first heard it in India in September. So here is A-Y-A, a.k.a. uh, Abdullah Yusuf Ali, or Ayya, the translator of the Holy Quran that's best known. In fact, what he suggested and what happened in one of his English translations was... People can't read Arabic. After all, he learned Arabic as a second or third language. So why not transliterate it so people can read it in the Latin alphabet, and even if they can't understand it, they can pronounce it. So he began the practice of having a Roman translation, transliteration, excuse me, of the Holy Quran with the full Arabic text, with an English translation, with a commentary. That's Abdullah Yusuf Ali, 1930s. Then there's A.J. Arbery. And um, many people will not be able to find this because it's now out of print. That's why this is my own copy. And the reason I did is because Arbery starts a tradition, which many other continued, of you not only do a translation, but you have somebody who's more famous than you promote it, preferably on the cover page. So here's A.J. Arbery. He's well known, but there's a man named Wilfred Cantwell Smith. Have you heard of him, Michael? Uh, Wilfred Cantwell Smith from Harvard University who writes, if you can't read it, Certainly this is the most beautiful English version, and among those by non-Muslim translators, the one that comes closest to conveying the impression made on Muslims by the original Wilfred Cantwell Smith, Harvard University. In other words, that means you ought to buy it and read it. And here's Arbery in his youth, like a dapper guy with a beard, um, very intense. And then there is, coming right along, I'm just flying through these, is Muhammad Assad, uh, 1980. But the most famous version is the version of Muhammad Asa that came out in 2003, published from Saudi Arabia, but not circulated in Saudi Arabia. Should I say it again? Published in Saudi Arabia from Jidda, uh, but not circulated in Saudi Arabia because the Saudi establishment disagrees with the translation and the point of view of the author, Muhammad Asa, even though he became Muslim and went to Saudi Arabia because he was invited by King Saud. So here it is, the message of the Quran by Muhammad Assad, translated and explained the message of the Quran. Um, I happen to know the calligrapher Ahmed Mustafa, very well-known Egyptian painter, a little blurry, I'm sorry, but this is a basmala, uh, and this comes from the Surah al-Fatiha, 
And if you just sort of get a glance, you can see how beautifully ornate is the top and the bottom, the gold leaf and everything. And you can get this thing online. It's only a thousand pages. Uh, but because the Ali Riza Foundation, for those of you who know anything about Saudi Arabia, it's a very major corporation, Ali Riza Foundation, sounds Shiite, but it's Saudi, they went there in 1600. The Ali Riza Foundation uh, writes a subvention, so it only costs you $45 instead of what it should cost you, which is about $150 to get a copy of the Muhammad Assad translation that has the Ahmad Mustafa calligraphy. Here's, uh, I always like to have pictures of people. Uh, Muhammad Assad, Assad, of course, means lion. Here he looks a bit like the Bedouin lion. That's a comment other people made about this picture. And this is my comment. This is Muhammad Assad as a radio commentator, because, of course, he was also a broadcaster uh, when he migrated to Pakistan after World War II and served as the first UN delegate uh, from Pakistan before he was replaced. Um, and then I'm moving right along to the first, or at least one of the most notable modern uh, translators in the United States, a man named Thomas Cleary who actually has no relationship to Islam, Buddhist Hindu background, but he did a book called The Essential Koran in 1993, which was a bestseller. And if you go on Amazon.com, if you've never heard of this, it's still a better seller than what became later his full translation of the Quran, the Quran, a new translation by Thomas Cleary. Um, I'll say more about him in my lecture, but, th but just so you know, this is what he looks like. Very hard to get a picture. This is the closest I could get to what I call a solo hazy image of Thomas Cleary, who has done an uh, interesting translation of the Quran, both the essential Quran as a paraphrase, a brief one, and then a larger one, the whole of the Quran, called the Quran a new translation. Now, everybody says, there are so many translations, why do you bother with partials? In other words, there are some people who never got through the whole of the Quran. Sometimes they died, sometimes they gave up, uh, sometimes they were defeated, all of the above. But, or any of the above, and sometimes all of the above. This particular person, Michael Sells, now teaches at the University of Chicago, did a book called Approaching the Quran, and again, like the one by Arbery, he has a promo in the front from somebody more famous than him, in this case, the, the best-selling author, Karen Armstrong, who says, if you don't know the Quran, you won't understand it, read Michael Sells. Um, actually, the reason why many people read Michael Sells today is because at the University of North Carolina in 2000 and um, two, this was recommended as a required reading for all undergraduates. The Christian right went wild. They said, this is, this is, this is the book of the people who attacked, you've, you've heard this line, I'm sure, the people who attacked uh, the United States in September 2001. You've heard about that event? Okay. They said, uh, how can we have a book that's required of everybody when this is the manual of hate that produced 2001? The chancellor overruled them because in the back of this book, unlike any other translation, and if you can find one, please let me know. In the back of this book, Michael Sells, which is excerpts, not the whole of the Quran, mostly the last section. In the back of Michael Sells, there's a disc. And on the disc are recitations of the Quran. Luckily, those, those particular performances or recitations were heard by the chancellor, who's a professor of music, and said, I don't know a word of Arabic, but it sounds like great music. Everybody should hear it. <laughs> And that, I think, to make Michael Sells famous as well as this book a bestseller. And by the way, he's a casual guy. Here's Michael Sells looking like an outbacker. And then the final sort of humorous but a serious introduction is someone I don't think most of you have ever heard of. And quite honestly, I never heard except a friend of mine from high school days said, if you're going to work on the Quran, you better know Sandal Birk. I said, Sandal Birk? He's not a translator. He said, no, but he's an artist who uses other people's translation. So this, to me, I think is a kind of American invention. And I'm not saying it's good or bad, whether it's bidasu or bidahasana, if you know those two terms in Judea. But it certainly is an innovation that you have. This person is an artist, and I give you his website just so you could look it up, and it's also in the handout. Paintings, recent works, American Quran, all 114. And if you don't have a chance to read it, I thought you should at least see one of them. He does, he's from California, Earthquake. The last time I checked, there's something called Sultan Zazala in the Quran 99, which talks about earthquakes. So he combines three different surahs of the Quran and references in the background, an earthquake which affects a highway in California. And of course, that's the one that most people in California read first. And here's his statement of intent. I haven't given you any words, but now I thought I'd do this just to describe how some people approach the Quran. Burke says, my project is to hand transcribe the entire Quran, according to Islamic traditions, illuminate the text with relevant scenes from contemporary American life, 
Nine years. Everybody talks about how long they took. He says, nine years in the making, this project was inspired by a decade of extended travel in Islamic regions of the world. And then he says much more stuff. At the end he says, I use, or he uses copyright-free English translations of the Quran from various authors, but mostly Rodwell. That's my edition, because I've looked through them all. The final project is 427 pages, including all 114 surahs of the Quran. And that's, by the way, what Sandow Burke looked like uh, sometime after he finished his project. Okay, so that's my first um, sorte. Now I want to go, um, uh, I may need a hand here. How do I get off this and do my actual lecture? <laughs> uh, that, that, was just, that was just a free, free set of pictures introduction. Um, I'm doing this in 35 minutes. I know I'm speaking rather quickly, but frankly, for me, the best part of this is not hearing me, but hearing you. Uh, so I'm going to do in 35 minutes sort of my, my recapitulation of what it is to translate the Quran into English, and then I'm going to try and leave the last uh, 25, 30 minutes for Q&A from you. And Michael Fiener has t kindly agreed uh, to collect the questions. I think there probably will be a few. And the recommendations, you can write them down or tell me about it. Uh, my email is bruce.bbl at gmail.com. That's bruce.bbl at gmail.com. Any comments, but especially if you have another translation in English of the Quran, for every one you get me, I'll, I'll send you a free copy of some book that you need. As long, as long as it's unique. It doesn't have to be good. It just has to be unique. Okay. So what I'm going to try to do today is what I call the impossible, to make a meta-commentary on Quran translation. Some of you may not have heard this word. So how does one do or make a meta-commentary on Quran translation? It means for me to identify and then analyze not just a select few, but all the extant translations of the noble book, Quran al Karim in English. Uh, one focuses on, one does this by focusing on specific words and phrases, but also styles and formats that differ from translator to translator across time and across the globe. So is this an impossible task? Yes, but I... But I, I cite Tom Cleary, and I repeat this, how well or badly does each translator, in some cases they're collective, so it's also grouped of translators, how well or badly does a single or group of translators produce a work which can be orally arresting, that is, it must capture your, your ear first, and then elicit an aroma, so it must also appeal to the sense of smell. And I say, the example which I give later is Kavechi, and uh, by the way, I'm going to pass these around so you all can look at this while you're I'd like to do this in a class. It's just like a large class. I'm passing around two translations of the Quran to show you how differently um, authors who are not uh, native English speakers but feel the Quran should be in English. Uh, one is an Indian, uh, Wahiduddin Khan, and the other is this uh, uh, Dr. Um, Kavechi, who I'm going to talk, Niyazi Kavechi, I'm going to talk about later. Um, I heard of Kavechi from several people. I went to my Turkish colleagues and said, well, how can I get this? They said, we'll buy it for you in Ankara. They couldn't find it in Ankara. I went to a conference in Ankara in August. I couldn't find Kavechi in Ankara. I'm coming here on Turkish air. I have a layover in Istanbul. I go to the airport. There are various translations of the Quran, Kavechi. So this book that I'm handing out here, I've had for two days. It's not to say that I haven't looked at Kavechi. There's an online version. But this copy, print copy, which I've thought about for over a year, and never been able to get hold of, I got hold of yesterday because I came to this conference via Istanbul. Call it miracle, call it badaka, call it bad luck, call it good luck, it's all the above. Okay, and here I am, talking about the problems. So the, there are three problems with translating the Quran. The first is what I call the Protestantization of the Quran. This, this goes back to missions, Christian missions, especially in British India, which says, that if you're going to do da'wah or proselytization, you can only do it through scripture. And Muslims were often the targets of Christian evangelists, especially from mid-19th century on in South Asia. And so the response was at once imitative and competitive. Because the Bible was primary for Protestant evangelists, it was presumed there had to be a Quran worthy to parallel and counter to meet and defeat the biblical opponent. But... I argue, the noble book can't be so easily translated. It's more than a set of words. It's also a multi-leveled message that requires attention to the overall message and not just to select passages. That's one problem, is, is that the whole project of translating the Quran is imitative and responsive to Christian, especially cross missions. The second problem is a particular translation called the Hilali Khan translation. 
Uh, some people call this the HK translation. In my view, uh, it's circulated uh, since 1977. There are probably over 100 million copies of Halal Khan in I, I went to Saudi Arabia. It comes from Saudi Arabia. I went to Saudi Arabia in 2008. I was put up in a very swank hotel. Um, I always looked to see what copy of the Quran's there. I knew before I opened the drawer what I was going to find. And there it was, free. Yet again, I already had several free. But yet another free copy of Hilal Khan in my bedside drawer. So this is circulated throughout the world as the imprimatur copy of the Holy Quran from Saudi Arabia. But here is what a Muslim reviewer said about it in 2005. The Halal Khan translation is now the most widely disseminated Quran in most Islamic bookstores and Sunni mosques throughout the English-speaking world. It's meant to replace Yusuf Ali. I've already said Yusuf Ali is the most noted. And by the way, he was adapted and circulated by the Saudis also before Hilali and, and Khan. And it comes, the, the Hilali Khan or HK comes with approval from both the University of Medina and the Saudi Dar al Iftah, which issues a fatwa. Iftah means issuing a fatwa, commending a certain book, in this case, uh, the, the translation of the Holy Quran. The Hilali Muslim Khan, and this is the, uh, still quoting from that uh, particular um, uh, Halil Khan. The, the Hilali Muslim Khan translation reads more like a supremacist, Muslim, anti-Semitic, anti-Christian polemic than a rendition of Islamic scripture. That's not me. This is this, uh, a Muslim reviewer saying this. In the first surah, for example, in Surah Al-Fatiha, the verses which are, That's the Arabic. You can read the English in front of you. They become, in Hilali Khan, Guide us to the straight way, the way of those on whom you bestowed your grace, not the way of those who earned your anger, the Jews, nor those who went astray, the Christians. What's particularly egregious about this interpretation, just to finish this quotation, is it's followed by an extremely long footnote to justify a tape based on traditions from medieval text. And though this Saudi-sponsored effort undertaken before 9-11 is a liability for American Muslims, it still remains present in Sunni mosques, probably because of its free distribution by the Saudi government. And then there, I, I put on a website here, for any of you ever look at uh, websites, um, American Muslim is very interesting for many things, but the article it has on the Quran, uh, which was updated in 2012 uh, by Sheila Musaji, says that uh, everywhere that she has gone, where she's appeared, uh, she's tried to speak against it and often been ejected from the mosque because she doesn't approve of their, meaning the translation that that mosque has, which is in fact not theirs, but Hilali Khan. So I think it's a huge problem that um, other translators can compete among themselves as to who produces the best, but the one that is the most widely circulated has already been approved by Saudi Arabia, available free, available online, and pervades many people's thinking of what the Quran does say or should say in English. And the third problem, beyond the da'wah that comes from Protestants, beyond, um, if you will, the bias that comes from HK, is what I call the mediaization of Quran translations, that is, the instant accessibility to lists of translation online, none of them ranked or evaluated. Uh, just before I came over here today, I decided to check online once again, almost 900,000 different hits that you can get uh, when you go online about tra lists of translation or references to translations of the Holy Quran. And you go through them all and you say, well then, which one is the best? Or which one should I read? And my argument, which isn't a very subtle one, but I think is, is necessary to make, is even if you look at Wikipedia, I tell my students not to look at it, which means it's the first thing they do. Um, as I'm sure most of you will do, uh, you'll go on and say, oh, what does Wikipedia say? I heard Morris, but what about Wikipedia? And you'll get great articles on 20th and 21st century translations, and it'll say, oh, in the 20th century you've got 29, and now as of 2015 you have another 29, so that adds up to 58. If you do your math on just what I handed out to you, that's obviously misses about half of the ones that are out there. But it's not just what is missed, it's that there's no ranking. They're just all listed. And so you go online, you get a list, but you have no sense of the quality or the accuracy of the ones. So this brings me to the other part of my talk, which I call the vision of good translation with examples that are both hopeful and dismal. In other words, sometimes in order to show what a good translation should be, and by the way, this is also the ones that I just passed around that you have looking at you. I will tell you, even before I say anything else, I already have evaluated those two. Wahid al-Din Khan, which by the way, also got free. I got it in the Rustam Pasha Mosque in Istanbul. I teach in Istanbul uh, every fall, at least half of the last four years. 
And I went to Ruslan Pasha, and they said, oh, you don't speak Turkish? I said, well, actually, I do. Well, you, you don't read a Turkish translation. Read this one. So it was a Turkish person also at that mosque at the same time as I was who said, take this Wahidin Khan. I already had seen it, but not seen as good as this. So the best copy I've got of Wahidin Khan, which is from India, is in Turkey, because my Muslim guide there said it's a lot better than what you're going to get in Turkish or something else in English in Turkey. That's how prevalent is the marketing of some. And I would still say, not just because I got in Turkey free, Wahidin Khan is better than Kavechi, which I had to pay for yesterday in Turkey, in Ataturk Airport, just so I could bring it here and show you how bad a Turkish translation English is with an English translation from an Indian author that I also got from Turkey. <laughs> Everything else I say will be less relevant than that. <laughs> so here's what I call good criteria. Accuracy, clarity, and poetry. I've, I've been talking pretty rapidly, and now let me just pause. I do think that's the priority. It has to be accurate. There has to be a sense in which you engage the Arabic text, and you attempt to really be accurate in meaning. Clear has to be a sense in which what you say is not only uh, verifiable and accurate, but it's clear, it makes sense in English. And here's the kicker. Poetry. Oh, I can hear somebody saying, he hasn't read the Quran. It says, the Prophet Muhammad was not given revelation as poetry. But shed, that's the Arabic word poetry, was not the same in the 7th century as poetry is in the 20th and 21st century. Poetry is a word in English, but shed has many other connotations in Arabic which should be kept remote from it. But there's also something called saj. And I've written a lot about this. Saj, which is rhyme prose. So you have shir, is something the Prophet Muhammad did not hear from Allah Ta'ala or from Jabil, uh, following the, 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 the canonical tradition of how revelation occurred. But saj, or rhymed prose, prose that has elements of rhyme in it, is not only permitted, it pervades the Quran. So I think there are three criteria. Accuracy, Clarity and poetry. By poetry, I mean sad, excuse me, rhymed, rhymed prose, not poetry per se. And what you find in most translations is something of the first, something of the second, even Abdul Halim, which I'm going to refer to in a moment, has first and second, but he fails. Even Abdul Halim fails miserably in poetry. The three whom I think get good marks or should get good marks in poetry are Shaka Turawa. Uh, an imam at Cornell who also uh, uh, translates the Quran in spare time and hasn't finished it yet. Alan Jones, who used to teach at Oxford and produced one that unfortunately uh, has other flaws and so hasn't been much appreciated. And Thomas Cleary, whom I've just mentioned. So of those three, Cleary is the one that you'll hear the most of. And I think they all follow this comment, which I, I take from an English poet, English-American poet, W.H. Auden, who was one time given the task of translating Dog Hammarskjöld, used to be um, the... Uh, the chief of the UN, um, and Hammarskjöld did musings called markings in Swedish, and someone asked Auden to translate. He said, I don't know a word of Swedish, and so he said, I proceeded sense by sense. And so many of the people who've translated the Quran, including Cleary, did not know, Eng did not know Arabic, but in, in trying to work with someone who did know Arabic and try to communicate to them, they proceeded sense by sense. They tried to drain into English something of the richness of the Arabic vocabulary. And so these are the three dimensions to Quran translation. I mentioned the three criteria. The three dimensions are semantic. What do words actually mean? Contextual. How do they fit into a larger pattern? And then theological. What do they mean? So the word. What do the words mean? What is the context for the words? And what is the theological notion? that they? And it, Hilali Khan while it's fairly good in semantics and context, in theology, it begins with the notion that Jews and Christians are enemies of Muslims and everything that is translated is guided by that theological dictum. So even if you have good semantics and good contextual scholarship, if your theology says, by the way, Muslims have enemies, starting with Jews and Christians, you aren't going to get very far in translating passages that are amicable to others outside of a certain bounded group of, of traditional, or some people would say uh, quasi or ultra-Orthodox uh, Muslims. So let me share with you some of my random thoughts about translating the Quran in English. 
and to doing it, making the Quran, what I call making the Quran into the Quran, but with music, having something of a sense by sense, or something that really uh, is an echo of the, of the charm and the profundity of the original Arabic. <clears throat> there are many strategies, <clears throat> but all relate to this one choice. I call it a pendulum. Where do you go? Accuracy or access? You have to have accuracy, that's the first point, but access or clarity is on the other side. So accuracy means you look at the source language, the Arabic Quran. And by the way, Abdul Halim is terrific there. I'm going to say some not so nice things about him, but let me just say on accuracy, Abdul Halim uh, and his version, which is the most popular one in English that's not distributed by the Saudis, um, is on the top of that list. But as far as access goes, that is, how is it rhetoric? What is the rhetorical clarity and, act, and ease of recognition? This Abdul Halim does less well on because that requires you to tilt toward the mindset of those who aren't Muslim, non-Muslim rather than Muslim, or Muslims, but those who don't speak Arabic but rather English as their primary native language. The best translations, of course, appeal to both, and I think there are only two translators who've really done this well. And unfortunately, neither one of them is really very popular. In other words, you can get them, but, but you... Well, actually, one you can't even get. The first is T.J. Irving. <clears throat> um, I'm old enough. He was a lot older than I am. He's now deceased. May he rest in peace. He's a wonderful man, T.J. Irving, uh, Haji Talim. Uh, converted to Islam, a teacher of Spanish, uh, University of Tennessee. Um, and he tried to do the, the first American Quran. The, the same thing that, that Sandow Birk, the artist, is now calling American Quran. He, T.J. Irving, was trying to do back in the 1970s. He got permission from the Saudis, and then when they saw what he produced, they withdrew the permission. I have letters back and forth where he says, can you find somebody else to bankroll me to get this thing going? I finally did find somebody, by the way. It did get published, and I'm glad to say I helped him do it. But then everyone panned it and said, you know what? He's trying to be too American. You can't be Muslim and American. This is back in the 1970s. You can't be both Muslim and American. Um, but anyway, he got it published, and then it kind of um, has not had the proper distribution uh, and so many people have never even heard of T.J. Irving, the Quran, the first American version. The second one, I'm, I suspect that maybe other than Michael Fiener, nobody here has ever heard Peachy al-Jahani. The only reason he's heard it because he's heard me mention it once before. You can't get Peachy and al-Jahani. This is, this is a, these are two, one's a convert. Uh, Dawood Peachy is a convert, a professor of English literature, now teaching in Turkey, but for a long time in Saudi Arabia and also Pakistan. The other person, Al Jahani, was way high up in the Saudi bureaucracy. He was on the Dalif top. Remember, that's the board that approves Saudi translations of the Quran. But Al Jahani bought one thing that Peachy convinced him how to do for access. Remember the, the two pendulum, accuracy and access? Peachy convinced Jahani that for the translation that they did, and they worked on it for 13 years, 13 years these two worked together. Then Johanni was killed in a very mysterious car accident. And Peachy had to finish it. And when he finished it, they refused to distribute it. So it's this beautiful edition. By the way, I have one of the 50 that were ever produced. One of the 50 ever produced of El Johanni and Peachy. It's a marvelous translation. Very clear, very accessible, but fatal flaw. Why did the Saudis not distribute it? Why did they oppose it? Because... Johanni and Peachy both agreed that for access, not accuracy, but for access, one had to translate Allah as God. So when you have the Basmallah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, instead of translating it as many do, in the name of Allah, magnificent, merciful, or merciful, benevolent, whatever, uh, and by the way, it's a great controversy is how you translate Rahman ar-Rahim, but the real controversy is do you translate, not whether or how, but do you translate Allah as God? Peachy and Johanni came down with yes. And because of that, their 21 years, if you count the eight years that he did it after Johanni died, that 21 year project is now something that you cannot find except in a rare treasure online. <clears throat> so Tom Cleary talks about this whole question and Cleary himself is very interesting, but problematic. And uh, uh, I say a lot about Cleary, which I'm not going to repeat here because I want to uh, leave time for discussion. But let me just say, I can paraphrase because I've uh, written it. I can paraphrase it. What I say about Cleary is he has two translations, one in 1993 
and the, that's partial, is called the Essential Quran. And the one that's complete, the Quran, a new translation that comes out about 11 years later. The problem is, he changed. What do you do? The same person, the same text, the Quran, the Quran. What he did in 1993 was like a jewel. I, I still think, when, when somebody says to me, oh, I don't know about why you wasted, they don't say spent, why you wasted your life studying Islam and then this book as well. I say, well, look at this. And I give them the essential Quran. They say, oh, it's pretty good. Is the whole thing like this? I said, well, actually, don't read this whole translation because the whole translation is not as good as the essential one. So he went from the excerpt, which I think he got right. He got the music, if I can use that metaphor. He got the, the sense by sense, the tone, the magic, the saj, the rhyme prose, right. This is my view, in 1993. But then when he worked through the whole thing, he said, oh, I'm going to produce this great new translation. He changed some of his earlier renditions. And the ones that he did are clunky. So, you know, I, I would appreciate if some of you uh, have enough sensitivity to poetry as well as Arabic and time and patience and you read Cleary 93 and Cleary 2004 and you disagree with me, write me a note and tell me where I'm wrong. But I could go through passage by passage with Cleary 93 and Cleary 2004 and I would say, with maybe two or three exceptions, everywhere he changed it, it's worse. Into, so sometimes you, you shouldn't study too much. Sometimes you should go with your first mark. That's, that's, that's essentially what I say about Thomas Cleary. And I, I'm passing over a lot of other uh, commentary on him. But I do want to say something just briefly about second order translations. I've already mentioned this and I passed around <clears throat> both Wahidin Khan, <clears throat> who's being read in the second aisle, and Kavechi, who's gone somewhere else around. <clears throat> both are what I would call second order translations. In other words, Wahidin Khan. <clears throat> first had it translated, and he assisted in it, but it's translated from Arabic into Urdu. Urdu is his native, Urdu, Hindi, Urdu is the native language of Wahidin Khan. And then with the help of his daughter, who's by the way a PhD uh, in um, English literature and history at uh, Jamali Middle University, in, so it helps you have a family member who's smart. His daughter, uh, Farida, helped him translate it into English and I think in some parts it sparkles. So if I, had to, if I had to sort of pass out to somebody and say, look, if you want just an hour, and you can't go to Rustam Pasha Mosque in Turkey, just want your own translation, this isn't a bad one. I think it's really very apt, this one by Wahidin Khan. Kavichi had it rendered into Turkish, and then he took the Turkish and translated English. And he, he argues that that makes it clear, but I have gone through, I, admittedly I've only had a day to do it and I'm a little jet lagged, but every passage where I look and I see him and then I go back to Wahidin Khan or some other version, it's always the other one that seems better than Kavichi. Beginning, and, and I don't have it in front of me, but I know it well enough from just a quick read, the Basmala. So what he does, Kavichi, with the Basmala, is something three or four other people have done. I won't say names because it doesn't make them look good either. But instead of saying in the name of, I won't say God or Allah, but in his case he says in the name of God. He changes it with the name of God. So the, the beginning is not in the name of, but with the name. Which you're allowed to do with that. I mean, it can have that meaning as being a company rather than directly inside, along. But still, the echo in English for almost everybody ever every child, they say, with, with the name of God? What, what, what does that really mean? In the name of God. And then he does another funny thing, Kavechi. He says, with the name of God, dash, mighty, dash, benevolent. So he doesn't, he doesn't even translate Rahman and Rahim as two different words. He does it a hyphen like they're a single word. And I, I find that jarring. I don't find that gives me a sense of the poetry of Rahman and Rahim or the Basmala as a whole. But that's my judgment. Um, and here's something that's very different is Ali Unal. Some of you may have heard of this. This again, like um, Muhammad Asad, I didn't show you a picture of Ali Unal, I could have. It's, it's again, like Muhammad Asad, the Arabic text, English translation, actually it doesn't have the Romanized text, so it's not quite as, as, as elaborate as Muhammad Asad, but it has the Arabic text, English translation, extensive commentary, appendices, glossaries, index. It's more than 1,300 pages, uh, easily available online. Uh, but Ali Unal says he, first of all, did it from Arabic to Turkish, and then Turkish to English, but he was assisted by two near-native speakers of English, quote, 
for editing the English tax, but Kidvai, whom I'll mention later, says that they should have done a better job because there's still many lapses in grammar and syntax in this rendition. Then there's Kavechi. I've said already bad things about him. I'm not going to say any more about him. Um, I, I think he really fails. Uh, you know, um, I, I have a note here. I went to Ankara in 2004, couldn't find it. Found one at Tokyo Airport, en route to Singapore the day before yesterday. It's the one which I pass out here along with Wahiduddin Khan that also aims to be simple, clear, and popular for English readers. So, in my, you know, again, it's my judgment. I've worked on this a little bit longer than most of you, but I still respect what... <laughs> The person in the second row is going to give me a real reading. He's going through both texts. So anyway, no, no, that's all right. I didn't mean to stop you. Just take, just take notes of what you saw and let me know. Um, I should have brought multiple copies. I didn't realize it would be so popular. Um, okay. So, this, so let me just summarize and then um, allow uh, and, and encourage you to question and answer. So the first criteria is how does a translator or team of translators frame the novelty of the 21st century? And, and I, I do respect the fact that we are in the millennial age. Uh, I should tell you that my daughter, who's, I have two daughters, one of them is an academic, she said, Dad, I'm really disappointed in you. I couldn't imagine what was going, was going to hear next. Um, I could imagine, you know, that I hadn't um, provided enough allowance for her or encouraged her uh, to go on vacations more often or made it possible. But instead she said, Dad, I'm really disappointed you don't write me letters anymore. I said, well, why should I? There's, there's the internet. She said, you know, and then she pulls out draw all these letters that I'd sent her, and they stop in 1994. <laughs> and you know what? Look at your own mail. And think of how, how little you communicate intimate thoughts with people who are relatives or friends by letter rather than by email. And she said, you know, we're all part, she's a, more than I, part of the millennial generation, as it's called, from 1994 to now. But one of the things that's lost is this tactile business of a letter, of writing a letter, having a letter, keeping a letter, enjoying the feeling of getting and giving, writing and receiving letters. So here we have what I call the 21st century where you don't have letters, you have instead a lot online, and you don't have a certain sense of rhetoric in English that approaches the King James or even the RSV of the Bible. So that's the first challenge. How do you get the Quran in English when there's no standard English to which you can relate it? But then there's a more vexing question. I decided to take a real expert, Michael Feener, uh, and his reading the Quran syllabus. I warned Michael I was going to mention him even before I knew his dad was here. So I said, listen, it's, it's, all, it's all upside criticism, which is what we scholars um, thrive on. So Michael had a syllabus that he used at Harvard back in spring 2014, where the basic text was Abdul Halim. I've already said he's good, and I didn't say this word, but I'll use it clunky. That is, he's accurate. Uh, you can get the sense of what it means, but there is no poetry. No one would ever accuse Abdul Halim of tampering with or trying to produce side this notion of rhymed prose in his rendition of the Quran. But if you look online, not only Michael, but everybody else seems to think that if you want to have one go-to translation of the Quran in English, it is Abdul Halim. So, for instance, it's the only one on Amazon.com that sells this below a thousand. It's about, it's, it's actually the, the, as of this morning, the 546 best-selling book on Amazon.com. There's no other translation of the Quran in English that comes close to that level. Uh, but even so, as I say here, that's far behind Yusuf Ali and Pikthal, which have sold millions. Uh, I talked to somebody in um, India when I was there in September who knows Yusuf Ali's uh, tradition much better than I and estimated that it is probably um, sold somewhere between five and six million copies. And Pictal is less, more like two or three million. But there's Dawood. Uh, somebody say, oh, but he was Jewish. Doesn't matter. N.J. Dawood also did a very good translation, which Penguin sponsored. And by the way, it's still online, still available. And in just half a century, it came out in 56, Dawood has topped the million sale mark. So that's also an extraordinarily popular, much more than Arbery, by the way, much more uh, uh, th than Ahmed Ali or others. And so here are the others that, that Michael used. He did use... Uh, Ahmed Ali, uh, he also used the other Ali, Yusuf Ali, Arbery, whom I mentioned, who was sponsored by Smith. So I guess if you're going to teach at Harvard and everyone knows about Smith, you have to use Arbery. Uh, then there's Richard Bell, who's a, who was a, was, a, was a good trainer, but he did something which Kavechi follows. He rearranged the surahs according to chronology. I, I just have to stop for two seconds and say, if there's one innovation that I really don't like from the Orient, it is arranging the surahs by chronology. 
It's not because I'm a dyed in the wool traditionalist, and I think it should only be 1 to 114 the way it is in tradition. It's just that it's been so long accepted that that's how you refer to it, that even if you disagree that that's the best way to do it, it's a way that most people can refer to it and do it. So if you open up the Quran and you have Surah uh, Al-Qadr as the first one, you don't, you don't really feel as if you're launched into the Quran. You, you're expecting Surah Al-Fatiha. So it, it's, there's some traditions that are open to challenge and change, but that one about going from 1 to 114 in the translation of the Holy Quran, I think is one that should be kept. And Bell violated that. Um, uh, of course, uh, also Rodwell did. And Kavechi and others have said, oh no, you understand it much better if you understood the revelations as the Prophet Muhammad received it from 610 uh, to 622 and then 622 to 632. Uh, then, then there's Fakhli, I'll pass over him and Pickthal. So let me just make this first comment about, a final comment about two Orientalists from Michael's list. Bell, as I've already said, followed Broadwell in privileging chronology over tradition. That means you go from the first revelation to the final revelation. So you start with Qadr and end with Nasib instead of Fatiha uh, uh, and Fatah. So, and Dawood is, 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 follows their lead in his first tradition, but because he got criticized, and I told you he sold over a million, <laughs> I don't mean to be so particular, but the, when, he, when, he, when he did his first translation, Dawood, and he did it by chronology, he only sold a, a less than 100,000. When he changed it to the regular, he sold another million. So obviously, I'm not the only one who finds it easier to go through the tradition from 1 to 114 instead of changing it by chronology. And I haven't mentioned Arbery except to say, other than the, 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 the puff from a pal that he got from Smith, most critics and also all reviewers deal, think that he did the best job of any Orientalist in attempting to find echoes of the Noble Quran. So beyond Michael, I want to cite one other person who, who gives uh, uh, lists of the Quran and gives criteria. This is Kidvai. Um, I met him when I was in India in September. I'd corresponded with him for a long time and had the privilege of meeting him and spending a whole afternoon into an evening with him talking about Quran and Quran translation. Uh, Abd al-Rahim Qidvai, uh, professor at Aligarh Muslim University in India, but also works at Leicester Foundation in, in England. Uh, he's done a review. You can get online. Tra- uh, by the way, if you just want to go online, Kidvai, translating the untranslatable. If you go online, just remember K-I-D-W-A-I, Kidvai, translating the untranslatable, you can get his entire review of all 60 of these translations. So I'm not going to say more about it now, except that he does evaluate everybody and does it according to whether they're um, what he calls Orthodox or Shiite. Um, and of course, if they're Ahmadi, they're completely off the charts. He doesn't allow it. Um, finally, I say some words about the internet. Uh, Tanzil.net has a large sampling. I give all the ones that they give. Alim.org has only four. This is what I find really strange. I, I, I like Alim.org. It, it has a very nice layout as, as a site. And it uses Assad that I also use from time to time. And Pictal Yusuf Ali, who are two of the top of all time. But then it uses Malik. And I have to say, until I looked at this, I, hadn't, I never thought about Malik. But then I went through and looked at it. And I looked about Malik. I actually have my own copy of Malik, which I didn't bring with me. Muhammad Faruk Azam Malik. And it's all about somebody who, again, makes the same claim as T.J. Irving that he's providing, these are his words, a unique translation of the Holy Quran in contemporary American English. Uh, and how does he know it's good? Because he did field testing. Um, you know, he tested to see how people thought. He did simplicity. That's good. Understandability. That's also good. I've said clarity is important. Then he doesn't outline a pertinent information. As he tells you when it was revealed, the issues that are in each one. But then catch this. The fifth criteria is he started the project in 1991, Completed in 1994. That's pretty good, three years. Then he has different ulama in the U.S. review it. Then he sends it to Al-Azhar, or he calls it Al-Azhar Sharif in Egypt. Then to Umm al-Qura, major university in Saudi Arabia. And then the IIIT, International Islamic University in Pakistan. And he got their review input and approval and then published it. So in other words, he says, this is the real orthodox view. But the one that I think is the most orthodox in the sense that it has... The largest sampling of any is islamawaken.com. So if I were to say to you on the basis of all my research, I've been doing this now for, oh, I guess seven years, uh, thinking about the Quran, thinking about it in translation. If I had to give one site and say you only have one shot, one time, one site, I would say islamawaken.com. And the reason I would say islamawaken.com is because it does include um, over 30 of these of, of, of the different 
translations uh, and, 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 and gives criteria, even though I don't always agree with the criteria, they're very well done. And then if you look at other people who try and cite um, their own stuff, the one I would tell you that I think is the most um, inflated, self-inflated, self-congratulatory, and the least valuable is Todd F. Holiday. He's the Penguin translation that followed N.J. Daoud. And if you want to see how somebody can be bombastic and never even realize how silly they are, look at his lecture about translating the Quran. If you just did um, Holiday translating the Quran, you'd get it. But if you want to know it, it's, it's here. Uh, Warburg is at so S-A-S-A-C-U-K. Um, he ignores Cleary altogether. He says the only translators that are worth considering are Dawood, Fakhi, which is one of the ones that Michael included, and Abdul Halim. So actually he has three of Michael's seven uh, that he Holiday likes. But I noticed I never talked to Michael why he didn't include Holiday. But I can imagine it's because he didn't find it as edifying as his predecessor, Dawood. And then I've already talked to you about Pichi and Johani, so I don't need to tell you that, except they use Pichthal as their model, but then try and prove it. So here's my conclusion, uh, and then I want to open up to questions. <clears throat> and I'll read this a little bit more slowly. There's no closure in sight for English translations of the Holy Book or the Noble Quran. Translations will, abou will abound, that is, they'll proliferate online, offline, for the rest of, of, of this decade and the remainder of the 21st century. In other words, if you look at that excerpt uh, that I uh, uh, handed out to you, that you'll, you'll, you'll see that uh, already in the first 15 years, uh, I'll count this year as already gone, even though it's January 2015, because I cite some, some translations that are still forthcoming, like uh, the Jane uh, McAuliffe one from Norton, and also the site of St. Nasser from Harper. So they're not out yet, but they will be out by the end of 2015. If you count through 2015, <clears throat> you've had over 40 translations already in this century, and you've had 70 in the whole of the 20th century. So I think there's a good chance that by 2020, we're going to have more translations of the Quran in English in 20 years than we had in the whole previous century. Which means that what I gave today as a lecture is just a starting point for a, a, um, further reflection. But I think one of the questions that I'd like you to consider, and one that I consider all the time, is when the work at hand is the noble book, the Holy Quran, one has to wonder out loud, why are, do so many come from South Asia? In other words, if you work and forget about orthodox, unorthodox, acceptable, unacceptable, piecemeal, or wholesale, you look at the number of translations of the Quran, three quarters, fully three quarters of all the translation of English come from South Asia. India or Pakistan. A few, but not as many from Bangladesh. So the question is, why so many from South Asia, and why do they seem to be increasing at an exponential rate in the new century? So I give a partial answer to this question, that the market share of South Asian Muslims wanting to read the Holy Quran in English has increased more rapidly than the skill of scholars or the wildness of book publishers to meet that demand. In other words, more people want it than there have been copies <coughs> produced. And the intent of these several contenders is not to forsake the Arabic original, nor to downplay the several Urdu versions, but to grasp the sense, and if they're lucky, to elicit a whiff of the aroma of the original in a dominant global language. Thank you very much.